aircraft carriers have long been a symbol of naval superiority and might. Since the retirement of battleships, carriers have served as capital ships and navies worldwide. Most major global naval powers, the United States, Russia, China, the United Kingdom, France, and India all operate fixed-wing aircraft carriers. Other nations such as Japan, Italy, Brazil, Spain, Australia, Egypt, and Thailand also operate either fixed-wing or helicopter carriers. But a perhaps forgotten part of history is the service of aircraft carriers in the Royal Canadian Navy. In fact, Canada has operated not just one, but three different carriers throughout its history. This is the story of Canada's forgotten carriers. Though we may get a bit bent from time to time, we shall never be beaten. Although the Royal Canadian Navy did not receive its first aircraft carrier until after the Second World War in 1946, the story of Canada's carriers actually begins during the war in 1943. It had been over two years since the signing of the Lend-Lease Act, which saw the United States transfer military equipment to other Allied nations, most famously to the Soviet Union and Great Britain. Lend-Lease saw aircraft, ships, and other military supplies transferred to Britain. One type of ship that was being transferred in 1943 was the Bogue class of escort carriers. Escort carriers, unlike larger fleet carriers, could only carry a relatively small number of aircraft and were much smaller. They were also much slower than similarly sized light carriers. Escort carriers, as their name might suggest, were used to escort merchant convoys, providing air cover at sea where land-based air cover was not possible. Many escort carriers were originally merchant ships that were converted to be carriers to keep costs down. Two groups of Bogue class carriers were made, the first group being converted merchant vessels and the second being purpose-built as carriers. One of these Bogue class carriers was the USS Edisto. Part of the second group of Bogue class carriers, the Edisto was originally laid down as a freighter in October of 1942, but before the ship was completed, the hull was purchased by the U.S. Navy, and the ship was launched on March 9, 1943, as the carrier USS Edisto. However, while still under construction, it was decided that the Edisto would be transferred to the Royal Navy under the Land Lease Act. As it was in that second group of purpose-built Bogue carriers, rather than the converted merchant vessels, it was reclassified as a ruler-class vessel, and on September 7th, the newly renamed HMS Nabob was delivered to the Royal Navy in Tacoma, Washington. The Nabob then sailed for nearby Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, for Royal Navy modifications, which were completed in January of 1944. It is around this time where the Canadians entered the picture. The Royal Canadian Navy had been playing a crucial role in the ongoing Battle of the Atlantic. They escorted convoys from North America to Great Britain, defending merchant ships against German U-boats. The Canadians mostly operated destroyers and corvettes, and had requested the Royal Navy transfer some escort carriers to the Royal Canadian Navy to give them carrier experience before eventually getting their own carriers. Unfortunately for the Canadians, the Royal Navy only operated escort carriers that had been lent to them by the Americans, and were not allowed to transfer them to other nations. So, a compromise was made. The Nabob would remain a Royal Navy vessel, but would be manned by a mostly Canadian crew to give Canadian sailors experience working on carriers. The air crew would remain British, part of the Fleet Air Arm, as Canada didn't have enough naval aviators available to man a carrier. A similar agreement was reached with another ruler class carrier, the HMS Puncher. The Nabob, under the command of Royal Canadian Navy officer Captain Horatio Nelson Lay, sailed first for San Diego, where they picked up 852 Fleet Air Arm Squadron, equipped with TBF Avengers. The Nabob then sailed to Norfolk, Virginia, where it picked up P-51 Mustangs and their American crews bound for England. The Nabob arrived in Britain and was assigned to the British Home Fleet in Scapa Flow in August of 1944. The Puncher made multiple trips between North America and England, ferrying aircraft, before also joining the Home Fleet in February of 1945. After joining the Home Fleet, Nabob first took part in Operation Offspring, conducting mine-laying operations off the Norwegian coast. The Nabob then took part in Operation Goodwood, launching attacks on the German battleship Tirpitz. It was during Goodwood, on August 22nd, while withdrawing to refuel, Nabob was torpedoed by the German submarine U-354, causing the explosion which killed 21 of the crew, including 11 Canadians. The ship began to list, but the crew was able to control the flooding, and Nabob limped back to Scapa Flow, 
arriving on August 27th. The ship was judged to be damaged beyond repair and was beached and used as spare parts. The HMS Puncher had slightly more success during her career, taking part in mining operations off of Norway and launching airstrikes on factories. The Puncher survived the war and both the Nabob and the Puncher were converted to merchant vessels after the war. After the Second World War, the Royal Canadian Navy possessed the third largest navy in the world, but were still without a carrier of their own. The Nabob and Puncher had been good starting points, but the heyday of the escort carrier was over, and Canada had begun to set its sights on bigger ships. Before the war was even over, the Royal Navy had offered to loan Canada two light aircraft carriers which were under construction in the UK, with an option to buy at a later date. It was hoped for a short time that these larger, better carriers could perhaps help Canada play a larger role in the war in the Pacific. But as the war ended, the carriers had still not been delivered. It was not until January 1946 that the first of these carriers, the Colossus-class carrier HMCS Warrior, was commissioned. It arrived in Canada in March 1946, along with a complement of Sea Fire and Firefly aircraft from 803 and 825 squadrons which had also been transferred to the Royal Canadian Navy and would be Canada's first naval aviation squadrons. Unfortunately for the Canadians, the Warrior had been built to operate in the warm climates of the Indian Ocean and had not been built with heaters. This proved to be a problem for the Warrior, which was supposed to operate in Canada, a country with a very cold climate, especially in the waters in the North Atlantic off of Canada's eastern coast. In November, the Warrior was transferred to Canada's Pacific Fleet based in Esquimalt, British Columbia where the climate was much warmer. As Canada waited for the second carrier to be delivered, the Navy realized that, due to increased cuts in defense spending, it would only be able to operate one aircraft carrier and not two. Seeing as the Warrior lacked heating and was smaller than the carrier that was soon to be delivered, which was of the newer Majestic class, the RCN decided not to exercise the option to buy the Warrior, but to instead return it to the Royal Navy once the second carrier had been delivered. The Warrior proved to be useful to train Canadian air crews in naval aviation, but in February of 1948, the HMCS Warrior left Canada for the last time and was returned to the Royal Navy, where it became the HMS Warrior. Later that year, in April of 1948, the newest Royal Canadian Navy aircraft carrier was commissioned, the HMCS Magnificent. The Magnificent was a Majestic class carrier, which was a newer, updated version of the Colossus and was capable of handling larger and faster aircraft along with newer onboard equipment. Both were variants of the British 1942 design of fleet light carriers. The Magnificent, which affectionately was known as the Maggie, arrived in Canada at Halifax in June of 1948. The Magnificent carried ferry Firefly, TBF Avenger, and Hawker Sea Fury aircraft, but was unable to accommodate jet aircraft. The Magnificent began its RCN career by taking part in a number of training missions, sailing through Hudson's Bay before returning to the UK to get newer aircraft. After returning to Canada in 1949, the Magnificent took part in fleet maneuvers in the Caribbean, where it was the site of a brief mutiny incident, where 32 aircraft handlers refused orders to report to their stations as a protest. After the problem in the Caribbean was rectified and the fleet maneuvers were completed, the Magnificent returned to Canada, where it struck a rock and ran aground 70 miles off of Halifax. It was freed and able to return to port under her own power, albeit with several flooded compartments. The next year in August of 1950, the Magnificent, along with the tribal class destroyers HMCS Huron and HMCS Micmac, sailed from her home port of Halifax to embark on a three-month-long training cruise that would see the ships tour throughout Europe. The three ships, which formed the Canadian Special Service Squadron, arrived near Derry in Northern Ireland on the 1st of September 1950. Around this time, the Korean War was in full swing, and although the Royal Canadian Navy was sending a number of destroyers to Korea, the Magnificent and the Special Service Squadron had already been committed to the NATO training crews in Europe, and so it did not see action in Korea. After conducting anti-submarine exercises, the squadron would visit over 10 ports of call throughout Europe, including Oslo, Gothenburg, Copenhagen, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Antwerp, Portsmouth, Cherbourg, Lisbon, and Gibraltar. After this, the squadron returned to Britain and arrived at Scapa Flow to take part in various exercises with the Royal Navy's home fleet. After this, the Magnificent, Micmac, and Huron departed Europe for Bermuda, where they rendezvoused with the river-class frigates HMCS Swansea and HMCS La Houlose. Together, the five ships returned to Canada in November of 1950.
Two years later, in 1952, the HMCS Magnificent was in Europe, taking part in the first large-scale NATO naval exercise, Exercise Main Brace. But it was around this time that Canada began to look to replace the Maggie. Jet aircraft were quickly becoming the regular in the world's militaries, and the Royal Canadian Air Force had already been operating jet fighters for over four years, and had just received the newest Canadian-built jet, the Avro CF-100. The Navy wanted to fly jets as well, to replace the piston engine fighters that were currently operating off of the Magnificent. Unfortunately, the Maggie was not capable of operating jet aircraft, and so it was decided that she would need to be replaced. As Canada began shopping for a new carrier, several options were presented. The United States Navy offered to loan Canada two Essex-class carriers, while the British offered the Centaur-class carrier HMS Hermes, an improved variant of the Majestic class. However, both of these options were too expensive for Canada especially at a time when budget cuts were slowly starting to begin. But a third option for a replacement was found. The British aircraft carrier HMS Powerful, a Majestic class carrier which had been launched in 1945, had been sitting unfinished since 1946 since her construction had been halted after the end of the war. It was decided that the Powerful would be purchased by Canada and construction would be finished, complete with improvements which would allow a steam catapult, angled flight deck, improved radar, and improved landing sites. The HMS Powerful was renamed the HMCS Bonaventure, and construction on the carrier resumed in 1952. As construction on the Bonaventure was underway, the HMCS Magnificent continued her Royal Canadian Navy service. In 1954, she traveled through the Panama Canal for a visit to the Pacific. Along with the Bristonian-class frigate HMCS Settler, she arrived in San Diego and then to San Francisco, before spending two weeks visiting Vancouver, British Columbia, and then to the RCM base in Esquimalt. After this, she returned to her base in Halifax. Over the next two years, the Maggie would take part in a NATO deployment in Europe, as well as a spring cruise through the Caribbean. As work on the Bonaventure was nearing completion, the Magnificent's time in the RCN was drawing to a close. Her final mission was to Egypt during the 1956 Suez Crisis. Her crew was shrunk to just 600 men, and her weapons were stripped, allowing her to carry vehicles, small planes, and a helicopter on the deck, along with Canadian troops. The Magnificent arrived in Egypt in January of 1957, where she dropped off her cargo before returning to Canada in March. It was while she was on this mission that the Bonaventure was completed and was commissioned into the Royal Canadian Navy in Belfast in January of 1957. A month after returning to Canada, the HMCS Magnificent left her base in Halifax for the last time and arrived in England on June 14, 1957, where she was decommissioned and transferred back to the Royal Navy. Twelve days after the Maggie left the RCN, Canada's newest aircraft carrier and the flagship of the Navy, the HMCS Bonaventure, which became known as the Bonnie, arrived in Halifax on June 26, 1957. The Bonaventure's aircraft arm featured the Royal Canadian Navy's first jet fighter, the McDonnell F-2H Banshee, as well as the Grumman Tracker anti-submarine aircraft and the Sikorsky HO-4S-3 helicopters. It soon became apparent that, although the Bonnie was a significant improvement on her predecessor, there were still significant problems with operating her. Although she was able to operate jet fighters, the Majestic class carriers had never been designed to carry jets, and landing banshees on the Bonaventure, while possible, was pushing her to her limit. Although Canadian pilots regularly launched and landed banshees on the Bonnie, US Navy pilots refused to land on the Bonaventure during joint American-Canadian exercises. However, the Bonaventure also came with its perks. It was able to perform around-the-clock sustained operations, having trackers and HO4S3s in the air at all times, which provided a 570 square kilometer perimeter around the carrier with anti-submarine cover. This made the HMCS Bonaventure the only carrier in the world outside of the US Navy to be able to perform sustained around-the-clock operations. After undergoing trials, the HMCS Bonaventure began her regular RCN operations. Her career began with a shaky start, with the Bonnie's air arm losing four banshees to crashes within the first year of operations, with three of the crashes being fatal. The Bonaventure's air capabilities led to her taking part in numerous exercises with Canada's allies, specifically anti-submarine exercises, as well as anti-submarine patrols. In late 1958, a patrol group headed by the Bonaventure found a Soviet submarine off the coast of Newfoundland. In 1959, she led a six-week-long deployment to the UK to take part in NATO exercises along with four frigates. During her return voyage, she encountered a heavy storm and lost a tracker aircraft following takeoff, with the four-man crew perishing. It was during this storm that these stunning photos from the deck were taken, 
and it's at this time that I need to thank the Shearwater Aviation Museum in Shearwater, Nova Scotia for graciously allowing me access to their photo archives of Canada's carriers. If you're ever in the vicinity of Shearwater, Nova Scotia, I highly recommend you check them out as they have a great exhibit all about the HMCS Bonaventure and they also have preserved aircraft that actually flew aboard the Bonaventure, including a tracker and Banshee jet. After arriving back in Halifax, the Bonaventure is forced to go into dry dock to repair damage from the storm. She remained in dry dock till March of 1960, and as it happened, 1960 was the Royal Canadian Navy's 50th anniversary, and being the Navy's flagship, the Bonnie was kept busy as she took parts in events, celebrations, ceremonies, and flying exercises. As the years went on, Bonaventure continued to take part in joint and internal exercises, with a shifting focus towards anti-submarine warfare. It was with this mindset that, in 1962, the Banshee fighters were retired from RCN service, and trackers and Sea King helicopters now completely made up the Bonaventure's aircraft complement. In October of the same year, Bonaventure was conducting exercises in the United Kingdom near Portsmouth when the Cuban Missile Crisis began. The Bonaventure, along with her destroyer escorts, were ordered to return to her home port of Halifax, where she was resupplied and sent to help enforce the American blockade of Cuba. When the crisis ended in November, Bonnie returned to Canada. The next year, after undergoing a refit to modify the helicopter facilities, Bonaventure suffered an internal explosion, putting her out of service for over six weeks. Over the next three years, as the Bonaventure traveled the world, taking part in various exercises with Canada's NATO allies, the Canadian Navy decided that it was time for Bonaventure to undergo her midlife refit. In 1966, she arrived in Quebec, where she would spend over a year being refitted. The refit finished in late 1967, and the Bonaventure re-entered service in November, supposedly ready for another 10 years of service, quite a feat considering the 1942 carrier design was supposed to have a 3-year service life. It was around this time that changes began to happen in the Canadian military. Up until 1968, the Royal Canadian Navy, Royal Canadian Air Force, and Canadian Army had existed as three separate forces, something the government deemed too costly and too difficult to command. Despite much protest from the three services, it was decided that, in 1968, the Navy, Air Force, and Army would be unified into one central force, which became known as the Canadian Armed Forces, or CAF. All three of the preceding service branches had ceased to exist, and their assets were transferred to one of the three commands of the CAF. All former Royal Canadian Navy ships were transferred to the newly formed Maritime Command. Despite already losing the three military service branches, the Canadian Armed Forces continued to suffer budget cuts and began to look for ways to save money. Procurement of new equipment was slowed, the forces instead opting to attempt to use what they already had. It was with this spirit that a renewed offer from the US Navy to sell the Canadians Essex-class carriers, this time at a drastically reduced price of just $4 million, was rejected. But the CAF was not only looking to save on purchases, but it began looking at items within its existing inventory to dispose of. The Bonnie was immediately identified as a money drain, considering the costly midlife refit it had just undergone and high operating cost, it was decided that the ship was an unnecessary use of money. In late December 1969, the last aircraft landing took place on board the Bonnie, and after a couple of final miscellaneous missions, the HMCS Bonaventure was decommissioned on July 3, 1970, a mere three years after her supposed midlife refit. The ship was sold for scrap and broken up the following year the third and final of Canada's aircraft carriers. Maritime Command, which is now once again called the Royal Canadian Navy, has yet to operate another aircraft carrier. An attempt to acquire French Mistral-class helicopter carriers fell through in 2015, mostly due to cost. As for Canada's other two carriers, the HMCS Warrior would be renamed the HMS Warrior and would serve in the Royal Navy until 1958, when it would be sold to Argentina, where it would serve as the ARA Independencia until it was decommissioned and scrapped in 1970. The HMCS Magnificent was renamed the HMS Magnificent after its return to the Royal Navy and spent the rest of her life in reserve until she was scrapped in 1965. The last surviving piece of Canada's carriers, the anchor of the HMCS Bonaventure, sits as a monument in her home port of Halifax, a symbol of days gone by for the Royal Canadian Navy.